Welcome this morning. I'm, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, we are in a series entitled Jesus the Messiah. It is through this series that we are uh, studying the gospel of Matthew. Today we're going to be finishing up Matthew chapter 8. Specifically, we're going to be in verses 28 through 34. Uh, I tell you what, let's go ahead and, and, and get into the scripture. Matthew 8, 28. Let's start right there. Uh, we're going to be covering a, quite a lot of ground this morning. Uh, it says, when he, that is Christ arrived at the other side um, at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him, and they were so violent that no one could pass that way. All right, so uh, here at Hewitt Community Church, we advocate expositional preaching. And we define expositional preaching as two things. Number one, it is saying uh, what the scriptures, uh, preaching what the scriptures actually say, as opposed to what you would like for them to say. Uh, It is also preaching the hard stuff right along with the easy stuff. I guess I would add a third definition or a third stipulation this morning. It is uh, also preaching uh, the weird stuff right along with the logical stuff. Case in point, we're going to be talking about demons, uh, demon possession, and spiritual warfare. Uh, I couldn't help but notice, and I smiled a little bit as Pastor Zach was sharing his scripture. I always encourage him to share a passage of scripture before he leads us in prayer, and I was a little amused uh, that he would use Luke 9 and 10 and would talk about demons. That is his wheelhouse that is what he likes to talk about. He loves, he loves that subject matter. I do not. Uh, I do not care to talk about this kind of stuff. And so this is a little bit of a, a stretch for me. But let's begin with what we know uh, thus far. Uh, we know that this story is a continuation of a story that actually began in Matthew 8:18, 8, whereby the demands of the ministry had taken its toll upon the Lord. And so he makes this decision for he and his disciples to get into a boat and to travel from the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee to the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee into an area that Matthew now identifies as the Gadarenes. For you and I, that was Gentile territory. And now we see here that upon arrival, the boat evidently lands somewhere near a cemetery where Jesus is confronted by two demon-possessed men with a reputation for violence. Now, as before, uh, you have to really get into Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel to get a more well-rounded picture of what's going on here. For example, uh, Mark's gospel tells us that this trip uh, began in the evening which for our purposes means that when they arrived in the gatherings, when they arrived in this area, it was still night. It was still either very late at night or it was early in the morning. The point being, it was still very, very dark. Uh, Mark and Luke uh, mention only one demon-possessed man as opposed to two. The implication we get from that is they just simply chose to focus all their attention upon one man as opposed to both of them. And then Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three, imply that Jesus encountered these demon-possessed men single-handedly, that the disciples were not with him. There is no mention made of the disciples here. Now, that's not too terribly difficult to explain. Uh, If you will recall... While they were crossing the lake, there was a a big storm that came up. And so the disciples had spent uh, the earlier part of that evening battling that storm. It's entirely probable that they were physically exhausted. And so therefore, they were still asleep in the boat. Um, It's equally possible, though, that they were just scared. I mean, I mean, let's let's look at this again. Uh, It's dark. They're in Gentile and therefore potentially hostile territory. Uh, They're in the vicinity of a cemetery. And and the first two people they encounter are these crazy, dangerous, demon-possessed guys who Luke's gospel also happens to tell us that they are naked. 
Well, I would have stayed in the boat too. I think I'd have volunteered. Somebody's got to watch this boat. Let it just be me. Uh, how many are with me on that? Okay. All right. So uh, as these men approach Christ, they ask him two particular or two peculiar questions. Uh, let's look at this. Matthew eight twenty nine. It says, "What do you want with us, Son of God?" They shouted, "And have you come here to torture us?" Before the appointed time. Okay, so notice the nature of these two questions that are asked. Uh, these demons, or the demons, I guess I should say, they uh, seem to be caught off guard uh, in encountering Jesus, at least in encountering him this way. And they also seem to be caught off guard in respect to his timing. Now, I want you to just hold on to that. We're going to come back to that in just a minute, but let's continue reading. Uh, before Christ can answer those two questions, they essentially ask a third question. Uh, that's where we pick up in Matthew 8.30. It says, Some distance from them a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, If you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Okay, so this story just gets getting weirder and weirder and weirder. All right, so what is the point? Uh, well, uh, let's start by uh, pointing out that, that this is not the Lord's first encounter with demon possession nor will it be his last. The Gospels record many encounters with demon possession. However, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke devote more time to this incident, this particular incident that we're reading this morning, than they do to any other incident of demon possession in the Gospels. And I think it behooves us to ask why. Well, if you will recall, this particular section of Matthew 8, beginning with verse 18... Uh, revisits the subject of discipleship. Beginning with this story of how Jesus was encountered by two potential disciples. You remember that story? Matthew seems to be revisiting the subject of discipleship. Now, that seems odd that he would do so because uh, we had just looked at the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard me say that the Sermon on the Mount, Matthews 5, 6, and 7, that is a discipleship sermon. And so you would think that everything that needed to be said on the subject of discipleship was said over the course of those three chapters. But here is Matthew once again. He is revisiting this subject. Thus far, he's emphasized two things. He's emphasized the cost of discipleship. Discipleship is not free, nor is it easy. He has also emphasized the frustration that is commonly affiliated with discipleship. Discipleship is a matter of you controlling your emotions, not allowing your emotions to control you. And so it would seem that Matthew Hill still has some things to say about discipleship and demons. In other words, he is communicating some things that every Christian needs to know about demons, demon possession, and spiritual warfare. Matthew is communicating some things that every Christian should know about demons, demon possession, and spiritual warfare, beginning with number one, demons are real. Demons are real. They are not legends. They are not fairy tales. Now, the subject of angels and demons is a very complex one, and it is very uh, too complex for us to discuss at length in this message. However, I want you to look with me at Revelation 12, 7 through 9. It gives us some insight into demons. Let's look at this together. Uh, then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, 
who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth. And look at this last part. And his angels with him. In other words, Revelation 12 implies that demons are fallen angels. That is, they are angels who have rebelled against God. They have joined forces with Satan and are now dedicated to serving Satan and in disrupting God's purposes. Now, there may be some who say that that explanation is oversimplistic, and it very may well be. But for our purposes, the thing that all Christians need to know is that demons are real. Now, the second thing that all Christians need to know, all disciples need to know, is that demon possession is real. Demon possession is not a fairy tale. It is not a legend. It it is real. Uh, You will find instances of demon possession throughout the entire scripture, beginning with Genesis 3, whereby Satan entered the body of a serpent to tempt the woman. Now, This really shouldn't come as too much of a surprise because the scriptures tell us that when we accept Christ as Savior and Lord, the Spirit of God comes in and takes possession, if you will, of us. I mean, look with me at Romans 8.11, which says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, look at this last part again, because of His Spirit who lives in you. And so again, for our purposes today, this detail seems to serve to confirm that spirits can enter and live inside a human body. But you should also know that possession is mutually exclusive. In other words, the scriptures teach that it is impossible for the spirit of God and the spirit of Satan to inhabit the same person. Well, let me take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 22, uh, verse 21. It says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. Look at this next part. He anointed us set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. In other words, and simply said, when you accept Christ as Savior and Lord, the Spirit of God moves into your life. He sets up permanent resonance inside of you. Now we see that he sets an impenetrable seal over you. And so it serves to reassure the Christian that he or she cannot be possessed by a demonic spirit. Can you say amen? And I would say that's motivation enough to become a Christian, wouldn't you? Now, that all said, just because a demon can't possess a Christian, it doesn't mean that a demon cannot attack a Christian. Um, And so what is our response to the attacks of Satan? James 4, 7. Look at this with me. It says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, let me just stop here and say, you know, there is is teaching among some charismatic movements uh, about, you know, that in in spiritual warfare or, you know, if, if, if by chance you're confronting a demon or something to that nature, then you, you, know, you take authority and, and you stand up against it and you rebuke it and you speak it to it in Jesus' name. Okay, uh, I know that's permitted in the Scripture. I don't always know that that's the best approach. Uh, and my reason for saying this is because uh, I read in Acts 19, there were some guys that tried that and it did not go well for them. And so we're talking about practical information in respect to demons and spiritual warfare. James says, submit to God. See, Jesus said, if you're going to rebuke Satan and you're going to rebuke demon possession, uh, he implied that that kind of approach takes a whole lot of preparation. He said that approach requires lots of prayer and fasting. You remember him saying that? And so we're talking about more of a mainstream approach. And the mainstream approach that James tells us, he said, submit to God. How do you submit to God? I am so glad that you ask. 
You just do things God's way as opposed to doing things your way. Listen, when Satan sees that you are doing things God's way as opposed to your own way, then he knows that he can't get an inroad into your life. He knows that he can't get in kind of an inroad in in terms of influencing your life. And so he is going to move on to somebody else. Now, that all said, what is demon possession really all about? What is demon possession really all about? What is it that Christians need to know about demon possession? Well, fundamentally, we need to know that demon possession is about defeat and is about destruction. Let Let me take you to some details Uh, that Luke's gospel tells us in in respect to this story that we're reading this morning. Uh, Luke 8.27 says, For a long time this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. Now, let me just once again emphasize that even though there's two men in our story in Matthew, uh, for argument's sake, let's just focus on the one as, as Luke is doing here. Now, notice those two details. He wore no clothes and, and he lived in tombs. Now, now, what does that tell us? What does that imply? Well, to say that he wore no clothes is to imply that this demonic influence, this demonic spirit had stripped him of everything worthwhile. It had taken his family, it had taken his career, it had taken his home, it had taken his money, it had taken his purpose, it had taken his standing in the community, it had literally stripped him naked. And then to say that he lived among the tombs is to say that his community had given up on him. His family, his friends, his co-workers, his neighbors, they, they had tried everything. They had given up on him. Now, let's put this in a modern vernacular. What had they tried? Well, Luke 8, 29 says, Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, He had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. In other words, Luke tells us that his community, his friends, his family, his neighbors, people that cared about him and were concerned about him being a danger to himself as well as a danger to others, they tried constraining him. But again, let's put it in a more modern vernacular. They tried rehab. They tried support groups. They tried counseling. They tried drug therapy. They tried behavior modification. They tried incarceration. They tried halfway houses. You name it, they tried it. And that phrase, many times that you see there in Luke 8, 29, it implies that there were periods when it seemed as if their efforts and their attempts were working. But the only problem was just about the time that they thought that they had this problem licked, all hell would break loose. And everybody would be back to square one. And so the implication that we're given is that finally everybody just gave up. They just reached the conclusion that there are some things and some people you can't fix. And that's what it means when it says in Luke that the man was driven by the demon into solitary places. It means that everybody had just given up. Even this man had given up on himself. And so there was no place else for him to live except to live among the dead. Because he and his hopes and his dreams were all but dead themselves. Well, getting back to Jesus' encounter with these demons, you'll notice that they immediately recognized him. And that's interesting because Jesus presumably had never been to to this part of the country before. It stands to reason that he would have been and should have been unrecognizable. And yet, these demons recognized him immediately. Moreover, they immediately recognized Jesus' authority over them. That's the reason why Luke's gospel and Mark's gospel tells us that when these two demon-possessed men approached Jesus, they fell to their knees in worship. 
That should speak volumes to you as to the authority that Jesus Christ has over demons and the demon in the spiritual world. But it also goes back to their assumptions as to why he was there. Remember, they said, have you come to torture us before the appointed time? I think that that's interesting because it tells us something else about demons. And that's simply that they know things. Demons know things. They know some things about God's plan. Namely, they seem to know that there is an appointed time that is a final judgment. They know that this time is coming whereby they will be punished. Now, just like us today, they they don't know when that appointed time is. Uh, However, it seems that the demons in our story knew that the time was not yet. Uh, Perhaps they knew that some things needed to happen on the world stage. Perhaps they knew some things uh, needed to happen in respect to God's word coming to fulfillment. The only thing that we can certainly say for sure that they knew, they knew that there was no way the Lord was going to allow them to remain in those two gentlemen. There was absolutely no way that the Lord was going to allow them to remain there doing the destructive work that they were doing in these two lives. Uh, Look at this detail in Luke 8.31. It says, And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them into the abyss. Well, there's another detail that's just weird. What is the abyss? Okay, well, the abyss is mentioned in Revelation 20. So let's go there, Revelation 20, verse 1 and 3. It says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore. Okay, so reading here in Revelation 20, it seems the abyss appears to be some kind of spiritual holding cell Uh, where Satan and all his demons are are destined, Uh, what makes the abyss so dreadful is that once they are placed there, they are stripped of their power, they lose their influence over men. And that seemed to be the thing that concerned these demons the most. They were concerned about losing their influence over men. And so as we read in Matthew's gospel, they begin to negotiate for themselves a better deal. They say, you know what? Instead of throwing us into the abyss, why don't you just send us into that herd of pigs? And we read for ourselves in the gospel of Matthew that Jesus essentially agrees to that. Now, that's perplexing because by agreeing to that, He essentially frees these demonic spirits to fight another day. And so that part can be a little confusing, I think, for today's believer. Why is it that Christ would allow these demonic spirits, even though he commands them to leave, essentially, these men, he still gives them the freedom to fight for another day? Why would he do that? Well, because the Bible tells us, the gospel tells us, That Christ did not come to the earth the first time to judge it. He came to save it. Now, let's be clear on this. We're talking about stuff that every disciple needs to know. Every disciple needs to know that Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. And the scriptures could not be clearer on this point. When he comes the second time, he is coming again. To judge it. But for now, for now, his agenda is not about judgment, it is about salvation, and it was about deliverance. That was something that the demons in our story evidently did not understand, and apparently they were not the only ones. Let's go back to our story in Matthew chapter 8, now looking at verse 33 and 34. It says, those tending the pigs ran off. They went into the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him 
to leave their region. Now, let me take you to Luke's gospel uh, before we talk about this. Luke's gospel gives us a little bit more detail here. Luke 8, 35, it says, And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man or the men whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. In other words, the entire community comes out. They find this man or these gentlemen whom they have written off as a lost cause, as restored and in their right mind. But instead of being filled with joy over this miracle, they have been filled with fear. Now, why fear? I'll tell you why fear. Because mankind in of himself is not too far off from demons. Is that every time we encounter the presence of Jesus in of our own, we fear judgment. Every time that we encounter the presence of the living God in of ourselves, we fear judgment. And we forget, just like the demons forget, that this is not the Lord's time to judge. We are living in a day of unending grace, of extravagant grace, whereby the Lord's agenda is not to judge us, but is to save us. Um, Even though these demons had, had been cast out of these two men, it would still seem as if they managed to strike a win through the fear that they created among these townspeople. But I want to take you back to Luke's gospel one more time. And I want you to look at this, Luke 8, 38 and 39. It says, The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. And so the man went away, and he told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Now, let me stop right here and tell you, the Gospels imply, you you have to dig and you have to look for this, but there are little snippets, and, and the Gospels imply that sometime later, Jesus returned to this very same area. And, and did I mention this was Gentile territory? This, this is Gentile territory. And so this is Gentile territory that didn't know about the Messiah. And they didn't know about the message of the gospel or the kingdom of heaven. This was all new for them. All they know is they see all this taking place. They don't know what to make of it. And it scares them. Understandably so. And yet this one man, this one man or these two men, they are left behind and they go through and they tell their story about what Jesus had done for them. And and, and the Gospels imply that a second time Christ returned to this area. And this time it says, you can read it in Matthew 4, it talks about how that there were people, scores of people, that came out of this region to follow him. Uh, It talks about in Mark's gospel, how that Christ was able to perform miracles in this region. uh, That he, uh, a, a deaf man, a man that was deaf, he was able to hear again. I'm reminded of a story I've told before. Um... It's, it's uh, 1945, just after World, World War II. And the nation of Japan is under uh, the occupation of the United States and, and uh, England. And, and there was a little island off the coast of Japan. It was called Shimabuku. And it was just one of a, a number of islands uh, that existed off the coast of, of Japan. And and it is said that whenever uh, Allied forces landed on Shimabuku, they found this amazing community that had no jail. It had no brothels. Uh, the people were respectable. They were prosperous. They were res- uh, it was an amazing, just an amazing atmosphere. 
And, and it was a stark contrast to other uh, extenuating islands that had poverty and, and disease and, and all kinds of awful things. And, and they, they didn't know what the difference was. What, what was it that made Shimabuku different? Did you know the story goes that 10 years earlier, just 10 years earlier, there had been a missionary. And, and he'd been on his way to Japan, but he had stopped off at Shimabuku for just a, a few days. And in that, in that amount of time, he managed to convert two men. Just two men on that town, in that town. And then he left. And for 10 years, not another single missionary set foot on that soil. But before that missionary left, he gave them one solitary Bible. And these two men managed to make that solitary Bible the epicenter of their entire culture. Scripture was taught in their schools. It was advocated in their government. It was preached in their churches. And it says that allied forces, when they landed on Shimabuku soil, the first song that they heard being sung by the people was, All hail the power of Jesus' name. That is the influence of saving grace. That is the influence of what two demon-possessed men that are set free can do to a community. And here we are, disciples. We, we are disciples. And what we have received from Christ is no less than what these gentlemen received. And so I would ask you today, what are you doing with your message what, what is your message to the world? These two men, they became living, breathing, walking, and talking manifestations of what it was like to have Jesus, the Messiah, strip the influence and the control and the devastation of Satan from their lives. We have been given so much. We've been given so much. How are you? A testament unto the power of Christ in your community. How are you a testament to the power of Christ in your home and in your workplace and in the marketplace and in the schoolyard? What are you doing? We have two men that changed an entire community. And yet we have in this room an entire community. And yet, what are we doing? Lord, help us. Let, let me say it again. Christ is coming back a second time. And the second time, he's going to come to judge. But the first time, he's come to save. If we're going to know anything as Christians about demons and demon possession and spiritual warfare, it needs to be this. Christ has come to save from all of that. Christ has come to save from all of that. And so for us... As the believers, and, and I, listen, I, I know this is no small thing. There is no such thing as somebody that's too far gone. Christians don't give up. We, we never give up. And listen, I, I, I was talking to somebody this week. Uh, I'm getting off script here, and I apologize. But I was talking to somebody this week. We were talking, uh, Joy mentioned um, Pleasant Hills Children's Home. Uh, for you, those of you that do not know what Pleasant Hills Children's Home is, it is an orphanage uh, just uh, about two hours from here. It's on the other side of Fairfield, Texas. It is a long-term uh, children's home. That is, uh, there are children that come to live uh, there. They are considered non-adoptable. Uh, by non-adoptable, they have... Uh, a parent or they have a guardian, they have somebody that oversees them. Nevertheless, uh, that parent or guardian is not able to provide for them. And so they are placed in, in this facility. It is a faith-based facility. They do not receive any government funds. And so it is entirely dependent upon the local church. It is entirely dependent upon other ministries, other nonprofits, 
for it is for support. Again, it is a long-term uh, facility. Uh, a child can go in there at six months of age and live there till he's 18 years old, literally. And, and that has happened. And, and this is a, a ministry that uh, it, on average, supports between 35 and 40 kids. Sometimes it's been as many as 50 kids at a time. Uh, they're very stretched to the limit when it's that many kids. But we're talking about uh, 35 to 40 kids on average uh, from all ages. Uh, a lot of times when they arrive at the children's home, uh, if they have possessions, they're in a plastic bag. And so these are kids that have to be fed, they have to be clothed, they have to have medical care, they have, ed have to ed have education, uh, they, uh, they have to have spiritual training, uh, they, they have to have it all. And, and, if, and you're talking about a, a ministry that if you're looking at it from a financial perspective, it is literally a black hole. It is a black hole. Listen, I know what I'm talking about. We have supported this ministry for many years here in this church. Twice a year, we, we, do, uh, we do this drive. Uh, in the summer, we make a drive for uh, uh, backpacks and school supplies. And it seems like no sooner are we done with that project than now we are engaged in adopting these kids so that they can have some kind of a Christmas. And, and I'm going to tell you, uh, let me just tell you from experience, probably 24 hours before we get ready to deliver those gifts, they'll call us on the phone and say, oh, we just had three kids come in. They need something. And, and, and you're talking about, you, I, I would love to take you there. Uh, you, 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 I can't really do a very good job on talking about just what they spend on toilet paper is mind boggling. And so you're talking about a ministry that is literally, it, it, you just, it just takes and takes and takes and takes. And it seems like that it never gives back. But isn't that a reflection of us in respect to the grace of God in our lives? Sometimes we just take and we take and we take and we take and we never give back. Christians are people that never give up. Let me say it again. If I'm, if I'm going to make this practical and I make it applicable, then it's, it's not as much about demons and demon possession and spiritual warfare as much as it's about the fact that Christians never give up. Christians never give up. And they never write anybody off, even the black holes. Because if it wasn't for the grace of God, you might be a black hole. And so, Father, today, to the best of my ability, I have preached your word. As I've already confessed, this is not a subject that I particularly like. I don't know that it's a subject that we particularly like to hear. But nevertheless, it is real. And you had some specific things that you wanted to communicate to your church regarding this subject. And so again, to the best of my ability, I have, as your servant, have communicated what it is that I believe that you wanted to say. Now, it is up to us. Lord, I, I don't believe that you've taught us this so that we would have some kind of spiritual paranoia whereby, whereby we would be looking around every corner, wondering, wondering, you know, what's coming around the corner, what kind of spiritual attack is coming. That, that wasn't the point. The, the point was so that we may, might see the power of Christ and that that power of Christ is applicable to us. And because the spirit of Christ lives in us, it is also applicable in terms of us dealing with other people. Lord, if we're going to deal 
with the world, then it's, it's not going to be by boldly trying to cast out some kind of demon and rebuking it in Jesus' name. But it's going to be by loving the unlovable, the homeless, and the drug addict, and the mentally disturbed, and the alcoholic. It's going to be by, by loving these people that are troubled and are costly and just about the time it seems that they're on the right track, all hell breaks loose. And we got to start over again. That's what you've called us to love and to minister to. And so I would ask you to, to forgive us that we become way too comfortable living in our bubble and living in our shell and insulated from that stuff. We, we are comfortable in just being with our nice Christian family and our nice Christian church. And yet, even in that environment, sometimes we're intimidated to even talk about Christ, much less live Him in front of others. And so, Lord, in light of Your second coming, knowing that you're going to judge us someday, and your word says that you're going to judge us right down to the very words that we spoke. We ask you to forgive us. But on the other side of the coin, we thank you for the grace of God, and we thank you for the salvation message of the gospel. In knowing that we have this amazing opportunity to be used of you in extraordinary ways. Father, I just can't help but believe that you have shared this message with your church, Hewitt Community Church today, because it is part of a necessary training that they must endure to prepare us for the days that are ahead. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, amen.